Hello, Nat. Hey. You legend. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very kind of you. Thank you so much for coming in. It's really um, good to have you here. Good I mean, you me. have a pretty impressive CV. Um, you work with you. Um, Run DMC, Ghostface yep. Killer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that that's amazing. How did those collaborations come about? Well, I mean, once the uh, once 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 I was in and uh, once I was active, you know, everything just seemed to fold and just like you know, like one thing led to another. It wasn't like any particular remedy was put in place to make those things happen, but I think it was just constant belief that anything was possible, and obviously the proof is in the pudding, and you know, actions speak louder than words. I would say that you're probably most well known for making hip hop, grime, mm -hmm. solely pop kind mm -hmm. of music. Mm -hmm. What what kind of music did you grow up listening to? Was that was it that kind of music or no, not at all. Um, I grew up on uh, the complete opposite to hip hop. So I was listening to the Who growing up and Queen. Queen is still my favourite band until this day. The Sex Pistols, oh, you know, like a little bit of Rebellion. Um, yeah, so really a really diverse background of music growing up. Motown. So then, how did you fall into that world of hip hop and grime? When I was quite young, I got into the Beastie Boys. Did you? So that really made me feel like I want to dig a bit more into hip hop, like, you know, in my life and in general, just as a listener. And um, yeah, it led me down that path. And then obviously Eminem came out and then it just changed everything for me. Was it in 2012 that you started working with DAA? Yes, it was, yeah. And so yeah. how did that partnership come about? Did uh, you approach him? Yeah, I approached yeah. him. I just, I just, I think I added him on Twitter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he just like, DM me back and sent his number and the rest is history. Like. And then you wrote Love, Lovely Jubbly. Lovely, lovely Jubbly, lovely yeah. Jubbly. I produced Lovely Jubbly, yeah. yeah. Wicked. So yeah. Um, today we're going to, I guess, talk through your writing and production mm, techniques. Yeah. Should we have a little listen to it first? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Why not? So how did, how did you guys start this track? What was the inspiration behind it? So obviously production wise, um, my f a couple of my friends who are big gamers, yeah. we were having a conversation and they were basically like insulting me or trying to yeah. by saying that I'm just like a dead gamer. Cause I don't so you participate. used to be a gamer? I used to be a big gamer when really? I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. Like Nintendo, the first one, NES, SNES. <laughs> Mega Super Drive, Nintendo. Master System, but yeah, like um, they would like you know you're you're a dead gamer, you know. So it was like, I think I was in a production mode and I was making some music and um, you know, I, I thought about that conversation and um, I thought, man, I used to be a gamer, so I thought the least I could do now is just make some music that sounds like computery, Nintendo-y. And it totally um, does. Yeah, yeah. It's Should we have a little listen to that synth sound? Yeah, yeah, sure. How, so, so how did you make this? So, um, this is a arpeggiated sound that I actually, um, I did this on a plugin called Blade by Rob Papin. And um, it was a synthy sound that was actually taken from a Nintendo game right, okay. of some sort. Uh, so yeah, so I just manipulated it and arpe arpeggiated it on Logic. And um, yeah, and then did some further manipulation on the plugin, which was able to like variate the pattern and the rhythm. And it literally just sounds very Atari, Nintendo-ish. It does. So did that arpeggiated synth line, did that kind, was that the basis of the song or did the beats come first or? Uh, no, that came first. Okay. That came first. And I think that was what was really strong about yeah. the production because um, yeah, it led the whole thing. And obviously the, my head was in that space where I wanted to make some kind of gaming sound music mm -hmm. and yeah that was the first element I, I created and the rest was built around. Okay yeah. and so what do you know what came next? Yes so the next segment would have been the drums. So are you using hardware or have you got a sample library? Or? 
So with the drums, uh, actually, it was done through a um, a Roland a 808 and uh, program original. Um, an original. So I programmed everything through it, and um, I think it just helped give that that cadence to the to the sound of the drums. Because obviously, we all use plugins, we all use stock samples, we all use different kicks and snares, and just pour them into Logic or whatever. But this was actually done from something external, and I thought that was more exciting. So the bass came next? Yep, so the bass came next. So what have you used to make this bass sound? So on this one, um, I didn't use, even though I used the 808 to program the drums through, mm -hmm. I didn't use the 808 for the 808, which is kind of weird. And I look at that now, like, maybe I was a bit of an idiot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, I used, the, I used the plugin for the 808 okay. through Contact. Oh, right. um, so it was just like a little 808 kind of library I have on contact. But there's many powerful ones you can get, you know, with all types of variated 808s, different textures. So that, that came directly from a plugin. And is that just kind of those few notes looped throughout? Um, there's a couple of changes, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if I try and section up another part. Um. Yeah, so that was the, uh, that's a, I think it was actually just one singular pattern um, on that 808 bass. Um, but there's a, there's a second bass. That's why I was getting confused. There's okay. a second bass for the hook, for the lovely jubbly hook. So um, this is this bass. It's much more distorted sounding. Mm -hmm. So how did you create that bass sound? So this was also done through um, contact, mm -hmm. um, but I just applied a lot more heavier distortion mm -hmm. um, for the hook because I just wanted it to like sound really, really gritty mm -hmm. when, when he's coming in, you know, onto the hook section. And obviously when I made this beat, we had no lyrics, we had no song. So there was no lovely jubbly, it was just a beat. Mm -hmm. But I just knew DWE is a very prominent lyricist. Yeah. You know, he's like, he's, the, he's one of the legends of Grime, if not the biggest legend. So it's like his punchlines, his delivery is very intense. So I wanted to be able to actually give him something that matched that, mm -hmm. you know, where he could actually feel like he wanted to bring something out. So I wanted to make the hook a lot more harder than the verse. So this is why I created a second bass with a lot more distortion on it. So do you create almost like a backing track that you feel will suit his style and then you send it to him and then he does his bit on top. Is that how the, pretty much, the yeah. creative pretty process works? Yeah, I think in the grime world, I think that's pretty much how it is. I right. think I think the MCs will get a yeah. selection of beats from various producers and uh, whatever they vibe with, they'll just um, record on, you know? And I feel that's the, the way it works in grime. You know, it's not generally not a team of songwriters sitting down writing mm -hmm. for MCs. It's, mm -hmm. You know, that's the pop world. Uh, grime is very like, Hit and miss. Let's go. You know, like you sling some beats, whatever Bit works. DIY, roughly. yeah, DIY, whatever yeah. works, works. You know, so this one, actually, funnily enough, and this is probably a good piece of information for other producers and uh, people in music trying to get into the business. This beat, literally, the package I put together for DWE was like I think ten productions or something like that. I was still at university. You know what I mean? Like I, I put together this folder. This beat was a throwaway. I just threw it in there. Like, that'll make the folder look bigger. Right. You know what I mean? I just went, like, whatever. Like, sh this, I didn't really like this production, if I'm honest. I was just like, you know, whatever. It's just a, it's a beat, but it's not my best. Boom, like. And that's the one that stood out to him. One, that's the one that he chose, yeah, yeah. Mm. And it's quite common. That quite, it happens quite regularly. I think sometimes whatever we perceive to be good mm. might not be what others perceive to be good. Mm -hmm. And artists are very artistic, obviously. Uh, so they're going to be very, uh, one directional in what they believe in and what they want and you know occasionally you can steer them in different directions but yeah he called me and he just said that's the one you know so I was just like really like <laughs> Are that, you sure? yeah that production okay <laughs> but you know like it's um I went to fabric with him when he did a performance a few weeks ago and he's still performing it now so and he I didn't even realize I'm, I'm a bit slow sometimes but he he told me it's, it's the go-to song for every more or less every live PA. Oh, so um, yeah, amongst others. But um, you know, it's nice to know that something I thought was shit um, <laughs> <laughs> did so well. <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was just a little bit that might it might actually go 
unheard of when you listen to the song. Like, there's a lot of elements that kind of get yeah, sit buried. Back in the mix, yeah, sit back in the mix. Yeah, but that was just a little thing to make it. I think that in my head, that was the element that had a little grimy feel about it. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a very simple production. Sounds quite you know? menacing, doesn't it? Yeah, that's the word. You know, like the the notes that I used, like it's just that menacing grime. You know, the dark feel. You know, that's what it was. But um, yeah, like this is a very very simple production. It's not trying to do too much. Yeah. You know what I mean? The elements are there. And it just works. Do you think that's um, key to grime sound? Things being, you know, relatively simple and stripped back. Mm, no, I think sometimes yes, because you got you get the grime that's very stripped back, and it lets the MC assign themselves yeah. and have take the front lead. But then you get grime which is incredibly com complex, and actually it's very difficult to decode what's going on in the production. Yeah. You get grime that's like borderline got garage elements, because mm -hmm. obviously it was born out of garage. So, you know, you've got the grime that is like got complex drum patterns. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think um, whether it's minimalist grime or technically mental grime, yeah. you know, it's, it's always got the edge. And I think that's what grime is. It has an edge. It has a rawness mm. that even Americans know, like, yo, what the fuck is this shit, man? Like they don't understand it, but it interests them. You know, when I play Americans wily and people like that, they, they feel quite threatened, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lyrically as well. Like, I've played a lot of um, well-known, iconic artists in America, people from here, just to see their reaction. And uh, Wiley threatens a lot of people, man. Like, you know, his brain ticks at a different repetition to everyone in this room, you know? Um, so I feel there's a lot of characters in Grime that are very relevant. And obviously right now, the thing is with me, I'm just trying to navigate the UK. As, as I said, I started my career in the States. Mm -hmm. I've never really done too much digging into this industry here, but I'm back here now and I'm, uh, I'm digging, so. Are you mixing as you go or what's, what's your mix down process? Yeah, like, I mean, as I build, you'll kind of level out tracks and make sure everything's balanced. Um, yeah, I do mix as I go. And I think it, it creates an easier job because then when you really get to the mix down, mix down, it's, um, you've done some of the work already. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you've got the whole production there. And then I kind of just take it into a bigger studio because I made this in my room, you know what I mean? Like my room is like, was a, is a box room. But when it's done, you know, I, and it needs leveling out. So when D-Double and Dirty Stank, mm -hmm. Dizzy's label, um, asked for the parts, Obviously, I went to the big studio and made sure everything was properly balanced. Okay. And because uh, I was at university at the time, yeah. I used the SSL. So I was on the Fancy. solid state logic. Yeah, so you know, it got the proper treatment, man. You got my money. Yeah. Lovely jubbly. Let me care for the chain. One sec. Let me care for the chain. Wait there. Let me care for the chain. Oh. Lovely jubbly. Let me care for the chain. One sec. Let me care for the chain. Wait there. Let me care for the chain. Oh Working with so many different artists all the time, you must experience some like really amazing and different dynamic in mm -hmm. the studio. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the most memorable artists that you've worked with? So there's a really you, there's a funny way I can answer that. And um, this is probably something I've never even really talked about. But uh, in terms of an experience in the studio, my experience in the studio was with someone that wasn't even alive. So, what do you mean? Well, um, so um, basically, like, before um, Efeni Shakur passed away, she's the mother of Tupac Shakur. Right. Um, I had begun a relationship with her and her team. And we were talking about doing a, another posthumous project on Tupac. So taking unreleased vocals and remodeling them. Yeah. Um, and she was very closed off about doing this because of the estate and different things and where she was at in her life. And we connected through a couple of other people. And um, for some reason, the relationship just really went in the right direction. And I ended up getting um, some files sent, which were like unreleased vocals. And, you know, I started That would have been building. amazing. Yeah, it was a great opportunity, man. And, uh, you know, I started building around them. And no one really knows about this. So I just thought I'd mention it because it's something I've never well, really spoken about. This is a very about. good talking point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, that happened. And then the experience of taking someone's vocal who's not here and someone was that I've a little bit spooky? Not spooky, but um, just surreal because he's not here. He's somebody I've looked up to for many years, and um, you know, and um, I've worked with a lot of people associated with Tupac, um, and they don't even know that. 
you know. So it's, it was just a great experience and an unusual one. And then obviously Afeni passed away after that. So the whole thing, you know. So where, where are ended. those tracks now? Well, um, I still have them. I still have the tracks. Um, but obviously I just keep them tucked away based on the fact. secret hard um, drive. Yeah, because, you know, she's no longer with us anymore. And th her passing was more, it was more important than the tracks. You know, I felt more empathy to the situation with her. And obviously it was sad that we couldn't progress with that project. But, uh, you know, what can you do, man? Life is more important than business. Well, it was a pretty amazing opportunity to have had. Yeah, yeah. And just the fact that it went that direction. I'm grateful, you know what I mean? Like, it, that, that to me, that I, I know. It's my relationship with the situation. No one has to know. I know I went down that path, so it gives me a sense of value. And obviously, that's, that's all that matters, you know? So, any kind of key pieces of advice you could offer aspiring producers or musicians? Any words of wisdom? Mm. Yeah. Don't allow anything in your life or in your experiences to, to make you feel like there's a limitation, you know, like a, like a glass ceiling, you know? Like we always feel like there's some sort of line we have to cross to be able to be accepted or to be able to be successful. But there really is no line. There really is an industry, but you don't break into it. You just immerse yourself in something that's there, but it's an entity. Because we forget that the industry is just people. It's just people keeping this machine running, you know? And the people that keep the machine running is the public and they're also people. So we're all just people, but we look at things like they're kind of non-humanoid entities, like the industry is an actual place. Like, oh, how do I break into the industry? Yeah. It's not a house, <laughs> it's just a business, you know? Like, and the thing is, you just immerse yourself in mm -hmm. it. And the way you immerse yourself in it is by connecting with humans. And when humans realize you have something powerful and talent to, to give the world, they give you an opportunity. But it's your duty to prove to yourself and others that you're capable of giving something to the world. And once it takes one person to just believe that you've got something, and they might not even be very visible. You might be in a very early stage of your life. You might be the most immature person in the world. But if you still show that one little spark, it's enough to trigger someone else to give you a platform. And once someone gives you that break or that platform, you're gone. Can you expand a little bit more on, on the talks that you do? Mm -hmm. I mean, are you now, I guess, aiming to mentor other people? Mm. Yeah, I already, I already am. Uh, I have quite a few people under my wings, uh, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I, I believe, even with everything I have going on in my own career, I believe there's always time. I believe humans have developed a bad habit of pretending there's not enough time in the day to do things. You know, I'll get back to your email like in a month. That's bullshit. Like there's time, you can spend time to do things for people. Mm -hmm. And actually doing that is not even an ego thing for me. It's just, I feel I've been blessed with opportunities. So if I don't give people that time of day, then I'm cursing myself. Because at the end of the day, if it wasn't for people having time for me, we, me and you wouldn't be sitting here right now. So it's like, I have to be in that position to help other people too, and to provide my experiences and advice to people in the best way I feel that they could take something from it. So, you know, I use my own experiences through mental health and my periods of very bleak times as a tool now. So actually my darkest moments in my life have now become my greatest. And I never thought that would be possible. Oh, that's amazing. You know? Thank you, yeah. Oh, when, you're in that, when you're in that cage in your head, it's like, you just think that's the, the end of everything. You're just like, I'm in here, that's it. And this is why I'm telling people, you have value. You know, you have a lot of value. You know, you need to realize your purpose and your self-worth to, to the go forward in life. Because once you realize that, honestly, it's like the key in the door is bang, you're, you're, you're through there. You know what I mean? So this is the thing, I, I need to share my darkest moments that I swore to keep a secret with the world so that they know it's okay to go through certain things. It's okay to not wash yourself because you're depressed. It's okay, but you just need to be aware of it and take action and make a change. So this is the speaking engagements. I do. Spreading right. the good vibes. Yeah, trying to, trying to, yeah. Well, thank you so much for thank your you, time Carly. today. I've enjoyed our little chat. Enjoyed it too, man. Bye, man. Yeah, man, peace. Yo, this is Nat Powers, producer, writer, human being. I'm here at Point Blank Music Academy. And be positive, stay creative, stay up. I'm raw, I'm raw, I'm, I'm gully gully, every day.
say I'm looking mean like a Murray Murray. Got these girls and they hot just like a curry curry, but I can't stop. I'm in a hurry, hurry.